This is the Mirage, the mechanical keyboard with clickable screens that transforms into a split board or a macro pad. I unveiled this as suddenly as a Mirage, and like a Mirage, it entranced 2,000 viewers to sign up to give it a test. But then it vanished, like a Mirage. Folks thought the project was dead, but like a Mirage, looks can be deceiving. I've been working on the Mirage Mark II with an e-paper touchscreen, hot swap sockets for chalk and MX, and ErgoBleds that twinkle like a Mirage. Welcome to my quest to make the ultimate hackable keyboard and, like a Mirage, a glimpse of things to come. Shimmer transition that looks like a Mirage. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, welcome back to Void Star Lab, where everything always goes according to plan as long as I write the plan last. The Mirage was supposed to be stage one of a cyber deck, but when I saw that thousands of excited viewers wanted to get their hands on one, but only like two of them wanted a cyber deck, I pulled a Scooby-Doo style about face that sounded exactly like this. When people are trying to buy your project, you might have yourself a product. So I set myself a new goal. Refine the Mirage into the ultimate mechanical keyboard practically anyone can hack. The world's most hackedical keyboard. If you're just here to see what's up or to learn when you'll be able to get a Mirage of your own, allow me to make it quick. This is the Mark II. It's a massive jump in customization and rainbows per unit area, but it's got major problems I have to fix and some exciting improvements I want to add. My goal is to get alpha tests rolling within a year and pre-orders within two years. If you're interested, sign up to the mailing list in the pinned comment. If you've already signed up for the alpha, I'm gonna put you in the mailing list too. I will only sell your email address to other keyboards, not people who make keyboards. Mechanical keyboards have this fascinating internal tension. On one hand, they're luxury products, and users expect impeccable fit and finish and details that express their style. On the other hand, keyboards are DIY tools. You gotta build it and you gotta use it, or it's just a pile of parts. That union of handsome and hands-on makes this hobby so compelling, and it's exactly what drew me to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Is that not the smoothest segue I've ever written? Bespoke Post assembles monthly boxes of classy craft goods, offering members $70 of tasteful and useful gear at a fraction of the cost. 90% of Bespoke's products are made by small businesses, including American artisans, and you always know exactly what you're getting. Keep it, swap it, or skip it at no cost. You only pay for the boxes you want. The Concentrate box is the one that got my attention. It's all about cold brew and features a self-stirring glass carafe. The kicker is the Bolivar Bitters, cocktail seasoning rich in jasmine and cinnamon spice, and I never even considered putting them in coffee. It is a killer combo. The Stealth Box is my kind of everyday carry. Discreet yet ridiculous, like a pen that's a whole toolbox and a handsome piano black folding knife with a ridiculously powerful spring. This one features a solid aluminum key capsule that shields your stash from snooping eyes and nosy noses. The Aged Box puts a personal touch on whiskey, gin, or even a whole cocktail. It includes these mini staves of the same charred white oak as a bourbon barrel, and in just over a week, their high surface area infused my Manhattan with the smokened oak that usually takes months in a cellar. Bespoke Post has featured French pen knives, Cuban tobacco, live oysters, and more, and it all starts with a brief survey that finds stuff you'll love. Click the link below and enter Friedman20 at checkout to get 20% off your first box, or go to bespokepost.com slash Friedman20. That's Friedman with a D and two E's, stop spelling me Zatch Friedman. Anyways, back to the keyboard. The headlining feature from the first video, the PCB that splits in two, is a terrible idea. Don't get me wrong, the concept is solid. Uh, it seems like everyone wants to get an indeterminate number of hands on a convertible keyboard. The breakaway PCB was just a really dumb way to do it, and I will admit this makes the thumbnail of that video retroactive clickbait. You see, a plank keyboard is supposed to feel solid under your hands, but the Mark I's breakaway slot made it wimpy and fragile. Worse, when you split the board, the tabs splinter into razor-sharp spurs, and if you sand them down, you release microscopic fiberglass needles that are going to make a billion concern trolls shriek bloody murder about guaranteed instant lung cancer straight to SCP-329. If you're only building the Rage deck, the standalone right side of the board, the following step is to throw the left half straight in the trash. I can hear the cracking sound as the concern trolls from my wasteful 3D printing videos 
those grip their pearls full throttle. So the first thing I did with the Mark II is flip the script and make the Mirage into two separate boards you can combine if you feel like it. A couple of keyboard cool cats asked whether they could add in a third half to make a 100% keyboard with a number pad. And now that the halves are independent, why the heck not? Pardon my profanity. That's why I put headers on both sides of the Mark II's board to add a lefter half or a right or half. At least I would have used headers, but somebody bought straight ones instead of right angle ones. Who hired this guy? The Mark I used a headphone cable to connect the two halves of a split keyboard, but for the Mark II, I had to switch to SATA cables. It's a bit of a weird choice, and it starts with a gargantuan oversight I made with the Mark I. How did I of all people think it was acceptable to release a project, under the Void Star name no less, with zero RGB LEDs? The Mirage Mark II restores order to the universe by putting an individually addressable NeoPixel RGB LED under every single key so you can obliterate eardrums and eyedrums. To test the effect, I hunted down some classy chalk and MX keycaps with brilliant glowing legends, which is also what I call people who support us on Patreon. You heard that right, people. Chalk and MX and Ergobleds and hot swapping. I believe the Mirage will be the only keyboard to combine all those features, but the truth is, it was all or nothing. I decided to add MX compatibility pretty early. I mean, the most tactical keyboard should work with the switches that people actually want to use. Even though the MX and Chalk footprints have nearly identical support pegs and LED positions, you can't just overlay one onto the other. One of the MX pads will short out both of the Chalk pads. But if you build around hot swap sockets, those through holes don't have to be metal plated anymore. There's nothing to short out. As long as you're okay with half a tab hanging in thin air, which I sure am, you can superimpose the Cherry and MX hot swap footprints to use the same LEDs. This doesn't just give you more options on how to build your keyboard. This lets you try out new switches anytime you want. Just rip out the old ones with your bare hands, assuming you're bare. You do have to commit to either chalk or MX, but a line has to be drawn somewhere. And speaking of drawing lines, I I split the Mark 1 boards between the Y and U keys for some reason, and now they're split between the more sensible T and Y keys to match literally every other split keyboard that's ever been made. I'm glad I went mad with power buying expensive keyboard parts because they revealed a game-breaking misplay with the Ergobleds. It isn't that I made the LED footprint upside down, although I did. No, the big boo-boo is that these LEDs are surface mount. The kale switches and the holy pandas that I used for testing have this little recess at the bottom to hold a surface mount blinky boy. But Thok monsters like these Zelios are based on the classic MX mold and their solid undercarriage won't lay flat on a protruding ergobled. I feel like there's so much innuendo in there, but I, I'm just drawing a total blank. If you think of something, leave it in a comment. This means these ergobleds aren't going to work. If we want to taste the rainbow, we got to get the fancy pants reverse mount LEDs. These fit upside down and hole drilled through the board, putting the lens flush on the opposite side. Obviously, this means there is going to be a Mirage Mark III, uh, and if you want to see it, don't forget to hit subscribe or sign up in the pinned comment. I'll tell you what won't make it into the Mirage Mark III, the clicky OLED buttons. As much as it hurts me to make this decision, the clickable OLEDs just completely suck. It turns out that when you mash a wafer thin pane of glass by the corner over and over again, it eventually breaks. Whoever could have seen this coming? For the Mark II, I replaced them with a special e-paper touchscreen that opens up tons of cool human interface options. Is that like a such a black mirror way of saying mice, joysticks, and keyboards? We could make this a bitwise calculator for the coding nerds, a password manager for the paranoid nerds, an emoji selector for the emoji nerds, there has to be at least one. We could make a trackpad, we could make an iPod wheel, we could even make three smaller clickable sub-displays, because time is a flat circle. Time is a cube that is also a flat circle. E-paper mounts flat against the board, leaving no crackable corners, yet I managed to break one anyways. In my defense, I was pulling it off the board, not mashing it down, it doesn't count. I found a very good, very normally engineered library called GXEPD2, and yes, that means we are now using Arduino and not CircuitPython. All will be revealed in time, my child. This model supports partial refresh, so if we're careful about how we design the interface, we can just update little segments without having to do the whole notorious Kindle screen seizure. Also, don't worry about the air wire. I pulled a classic Zach Friedman power play and only ran two wires for three-wire interface. 
This e-paper is objectively better than OLEDs on wobbly cutouts, yet I can't shake the feeling that this whole thing is a mistake. The panel itself is really thin and it sits too low next to the key switches. This also makes the board just ridiculously massive. I had to pad the left side out with three units of macro keys to keep things visually balanced, and because we have these ribbon cables to fold over, all the chips had to be moved above the keys. I didn't realize how big, big the Mark II had swollen until I put it next to the Mark I. But worst of all, some people want knobs, and I'm tying up a Palm Pilot's worth of real estate on a non-tactile touchscreen. What if we moved the integrated display into an optional plug-in module? That way you could replace it with encoder knobs, sliders, brushless motorized haptic feedback circular display dials, whatever you can design. Uh, the area under the module could also have macro key footprints, so if you're not into all the gimmicks, A, you're smart, and B, you can just get additional thock. There's no doubt I will have to design a Mirage Mark III, because even if everything so far had been perfect, I am about to get completely stuffed by my galactic brain decision to use SATA cables. Here's the situation. A USB device cannot talk directly to another USB device, so if you want to make a split keyboard, you have to wire the halves together. Mechanical keymongers expect to be able to select from a wide variety of beautiful and affordable cables. There are not a lot of options for making this physical connection. The IO expanders in the Mirage need voltage, ground, clock, data, nothing else, so a headphone aux cable, TRRS, could and do the job. The Ergobleds ruined everything because they need a fifth line for data and a sixth line for five volts. There is no appropriate off-the-shelf six-wire cable, but there is a seven-wire cable. It's easy to find, it's sturdy, they're fancy versions. It's a SATA cable. The price was reasonable enough that I bought like a hundred sockets in advance, which I'm sure I'm not going to regret in like 27 seconds. So I populated the Rage half, tested it, populated the Mi half, connected them together with my SATA cable, and I plugged it in. Nothing happened. I unplugged the left side, but the right side still didn't work. I might have permanently blown it up. The I2C clock was shorted to 3 volts, but this was weird. When chips spew the magic smoke, they usually break connections, not make them. I figured it was more likely that a solder blob or a wire schnipsel worked its way in there, so I threw the board in my ultrasonic bath, and heck yes, it worked! I plugged the cable back in, and ho oh, oh, ho oh, ho, that's right, the cable itself was the problem. Apparently, every single SATA cable by every single manufacturer internally connects pins 1, 3, and 7. It's to shield the differential signals or something, I don't know, I got a D in circuits and systems. I didn't even know there were cables with internally connected wires. Uh, I didn't see anything about this in the standard. All I could find was a handwritten note on INCITS letterhead that read, and I quote, Zach Friedman can suck our standardized farts. This sucks. I wanted to put only a single microcontroller in the entire keyboard, but to cut down on our wire count, we need one per half. My Ergodox does this, and it uses UART serial to connect the halves. But if we want to link more than two boards together, we are in a pickle. On paper, USB would work. Each board would connect to its neighbor using the Pico PIO USB library. But in practice, the difference between theory and practice is greater in practice than in theory. See, the Zhao's USB socket is on top of a board on top of another board, but we can't mount a mail plug at the same height. Therefore, the USB would work for split boards, but we couldn't put them right next to each other to make monolithic planks. This means we gotta go back to I2C over a headphone cable. But we're already using I2C to read the keys. We need a second I2C bus. I mean, I'm only seeing one here. I found the answer while battling the most dastardly bug of the project. Dastardly. It grew a mustache and twirled it. It grew a mustache and it waxed it and twirled it. For enough reasons to fill a future video, CircuitPython was far too slow for this project and I had to abandon it. Luckily, Earl Philhauer's Arduino for the RP2040 has matured tremendously since I built the Mark I. Over the last year, he has been adding features, broadening compatibility, and generally making Arduino clap all the right cheeks. I can use Adafruit's tiny USB stack to create, for instance, a keyboard that's also a flash drive. I also get multi-core support and you know how you use it, you just write a setup one and a loop one method. That is just... Mm. 
The only problem was that I squared C did literally nothing, and it was truly bizarre. I could scan for devices just fine, but whenever I tried to send or receive data, nothing. No action on the pins. It worked fine with the official Arduino core, but not Earl Philhauer's one, and I needed the community version to get that flash drive key map editing. I wasted over two cumulative weeks unpicking source code, probing data lines, and generally smashing my face into things. But I could not get the wheels on the I squared C bus to go round and round, round and round. Having exhausted my options, I filed a bug report, poured myself a sponsored aged Manhattan and gave up. Man, and then I got a reply from none other than Mr. Phil Hauer himself who said the words everyone just loves to hear. It worked just fine for me. For the first and only time in recorded history, that helped. In fact, it cracked the case. Earl didn't own a Zhao RP2040 or an Adafruit Cutie Pi. He was testing on a Raspberry Pi Pico and gosh darn, it worked. Earl wrote the Zhao's board definition referencing Seed Studio's pinout, which clearly labels pins 4 and 5 for I squared C. But pins 4 and 5 on the Zhao actually wire to pins 6 and 7 on the chip, and those will only connect to I squared C1, the second I squared C interface. The processor was being told to link pins 6 and 7 to I squared C0, which is physically impossible, so no hardware was ever assigned to talk to the keys. Scanning still worked because it's bit banged. The code is using digital reads and writes to fake I squared C instead of invoking the hardware. The bug was squashed, the fix was merged, I was sobbing in fetal position under the workbench, but in the process, I had learned that this dinky-ass Zhao RP2040 has two I2C buses. If we configure the second one as a peripheral, its neighbor, which now has a processor of its own, can read the board as if the whole thing were one big I.O. expander. This means you can use either half independently or link any combination of halves in any order. You can make a conventional 60%, reverse them to make a fixed split 60% with a display in the center, add another right half for 100%, add a left half for 133%, add five more left halves to make a 297% percent keyboard. The word half is now a meaningless semantic placeholder and I can hear Jean Baudrillard's slow clap echoing across the eons. So that is the Mirage State of the Union, or the Division if you decided to split them. The Mark II has its problems, but their solutions are going to make the whole project infinitely more hackable. The future is as bright as an ergobled. It lets you add any knob you want, and you can make it arbitrarily long. I'm changing the alpha tester sign-up sheet to a Mirage newsletter, and I implore you to sign up for that. I am mostly going to use it to remind you that the project isn't dead yet, although I might occasionally ask for feedback and stuff on it. There's still a lot of decisions to make. I've linked the Mirage Mark II's design files in the description, though I will remind you this thing is infinity million percent borked and should not be made under any circumstances. While you're down there, visit bespokepost.com slash Friedman20 or use the code Friedman20 to save Friedman 20% off your first box of top quality goodies. Indie hardware development is an unrelentingly bleak money pit and the Mirage would still be vapor without the brilliant glowing legends that are our patrons. That was a callback. Support from folks like lab scientists Edward Javons, Jamie, and Darkadis are what make our open source projects possible. Special thanks to our collaborators, Brian D. Swollen Nut, Karen Hausman, Castor the Catboy, Jeremy Arnold Schweddy Vaj, Chuck Faduk Small Dong, Acorn, and Command. I hid their names somewhere stealthy. Can you find them? The Technicolor Dreamboats we call our lab assistants include the Antifa, Nani, the Cuttlefish, Brad Stormer, Ryan Guler, the Benevolent Misanthrope, Thomas B. Myers, Iron Rain, Lydia K., Granville Schmidt, Max Lux says if you can't fix it, you don't own it, Trucku, DSA Boobakiss, Bill Schooler, Burunduck 3, Protagonist, Ashley Coleman, Stormby Designs, Zanforian, Nathan Johnson, Bob Dobbington, Rusty Flute, Michael Roche, Zach Eddie Goodsuck, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Hank Scorpio, Brad Cox, Azundo, Wielder of Iron Heater of Shrink, Katz, Kevin DeGraff, Varka, Powerful CCH, Talon Democratic Socialist and a Pretty Righteous Dude, Gary Duval, Steven Six Foot Six Figure Six Pack Schulte, Period Plots, Burb asserted nothing wrong yet, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, 
Bum Tickly 69. E Pun Man, Bagel, Ethan Gomes, One Handful of Beans, My Dog is a Bear, The Letter Z, Zostra, and I ain't reading all that stuff. Isakai Elf, Mahiro Chan, Desine, Arrow Raider, SXP, Sir Derpington of Derptopia, Zach B. My Daddy, Boulder Creek Yard, James, and Trans Rights. That is one supporter I support right back. Thanks for watching, and I will hear you clacking in the future.